I first met Anna in the summer of 2013 when she was the first female student to win the Hitchwa Summer Research Award. But she's been quite the student leader throughout her entire time here, which I can't believe how much she's accomplished in just two years. She was the president of our Society of Business Students Club, and they won many awards, uh, lots of different proposals, the Marsh Light Award, Future Faces of Physics Award. They developed skills labs that they uh, first taught each other how to do things and then taught them to <laughs> <laughs> There's a little cheery section of that. Taught them to <laughs> other uh, students involved in the MESA program. And then we hosted the American Physical Society Far West sectional meeting here at Cinema State, and she organized all the students to help support the conference and met Becky Thompson from the American Physical Society headquarters in Washington, D.C., which was a great network up working opportunity because. This next summer, she's going off to work with Becky Thompson in Washington, D.C. as one of the SPS nationally selected interns. And um, just to throw in one other thing, she also got herself elected zone counsel, assistant zone counselor for the SPS Zone 18, which is the first time in my memory, that, and probably anyone's memory, that we've actually had a student from Sonoma State get elected to that office. <laughs> the actual photo is on the National SPS homepage right now. So it is for this and many other reasons um, we award distinction in this department to students who have performed a lot of service to the department. And so, here are your official distinction cards. Yeah. And although Aman started out being interested in ground-based observational astronomy and worked with people in my group and also with Dr. Target on projects, she's sort of shifted gears into wanting to get more involved in hardware, and so she's going to tell you about the work she did leading a female team to develop our next pocket tube prototype. Pocket Cube, it's called A3 Pocket Cube, and I'm going to talk about the development of it and my previous work through this project. So the motivation comes from a previous team of students who built the T-Logo Cube, which is in orbit currently. We lost communication with it after a while, but it was launched in um, 2013, November. And there's a couple of them in here, Hunter Mills and Ben Tanya was in here at least. And then Kevin Zach was the lead on that. So this is also a picture of the original ground station. The ground stations are what you use to downlink data with um, satellites in space. And this was the one at Little H4 Ranch, which is Dr. Jenkins and Dr. Mosey's house. So this is the current CubeSat program. It's grown in number of students. And this is also our newly built ground station on the um, roof of the student center. It's up on the third floor if you guys want to check it out later. I'm sure Aaron would love to show it off. <laughs> and um, yeah, that's our 18 foot antenna on there. It's beautiful. <laughs> um, previously, how I started in this project, I did work on other projects before, was I was interested in antennas, and I took antenna theory for the um, electrical <coughs> engineering on campus. And I built this helical, well, I built this helical car freeload car antenna for a portable ground station so like high schools around the country could receive one and then um, you have ground stations everywhere so more data is being downlinked. And it was supposed to be cheap and also we tried to design a new preamp which was Alyssa who worked on the project with us was working on that and that's the picture of the antenna that we designed. Um, and then I started helping with the ground station built that's on the student center currently and I worked with the initial uh, data analysis or data downlink. And yeah, I've also designed a patch antenna, it's a spiral, and that's the picture of the actual um, template, not the antenna itself. But small patch antenna, 10 by 10 by 10, well, 10 by 10. And um, it's so because currently CubeSats have, well, T Logo Cube, which is right here, has this dipole antenna, which is really 
kind of like an eyesore. And when you launch them, it gets folded back, and they don't like that. They actually don't allow that. So it'd be better to put a small antenna on one of the sides of it. What would be even better, because if you can see there's solar panels everywhere, would it, if the antenna was transparent. So that was another step that this antenna could take. This was made on um, copper, so not transparent. And that's something I was working on, but then we started developing this pocket cube, and I shifted over to working with sensors. And I was focusing on x-rays because we know um, after like, if we go into the atmosphere at different levels, there's different levels of um, high, in, uh, high energy particles. And this could be achieved through a balloon launch that we were hoping to do, like high altitude weather balloons. And this is the graph of showing which type of particles we would see at which level. And we would go to probably, I want to say, this price says 130 kilometers, which would be the upper limit of the balloon launch. But that's also the, just pretty much the lower limit of the x-ray detector that we're using that's rotating on that table right now with everything else um, that could actually sense gamma rays and other high energy particles. And I was basing it also off of this other work that Dr. Kuminski pointed out to me from a different paper. And they did a balloon launch like this with a um, radiation detector on it. And the blue dots are the balloon going up. So you can see for a while the particle count goes up until it dips back down low, even though it's still rising. And they also had a couple data points from the descent. Um, our programs are written in micro logo language. It's based off of Turtle Logo, which was this language written in the 70s, I believe, designed to show that children can program as well. So it's really basic in that it's really easy to make new words and uh, implement them. It's not as complicated as C and other languages, if some of you know about those. And also, it's um, the compiler takes up less room and everything on board, so you can have your program read like recompiling during flight. So this is all the parts that we started off with. We, um, the top row is basically all of the power system, which I think has changed now, but uh, I focused on GPS, 9 degrees of freedom, death board, which is the brain of the whole thing, and then the x-ray detector that's on there, and you can't see it because it's hidden right now, but you can come up and see it later. So that's all I want to explain. Um, currently, because of crosstalk and other things, so it's totally out of order. Um, because of crosstalk, we couldn't have a GPS and X-ray detector running at the same time. That's a problem that we had to troubleshoot, and we chose to work on the X-ray detector with more focus instead of try to work on the GPS. Because GPS is a balloon launch; you can track it in other ways as well. Now this is some sample data with just that x-ray source on a rotating table like that, but then the actual sensor off of the rotating table. And this is when the table isn't rotating and the source is just right next to it, so the mm -hmm. counts kind of vary, and this isn't produced for error bars or anything, so they probably error bars are there. But um, the source on a rotating table, if you get it slow enough, you can see it going around <coughs> and you can see the frequency of the table rotating. And the goals for this project in the future, hopefully other people will take it on. It's really awesome. I know this sensor, the X-ray sensor, is going to go on to a future CubeSat that Dr. Jernigan is working on as well. But I hope this um, pocket cube itself will be developed further and go into the balloon launch or even into space in the next couple of years with future generations of students. And um, hopefully we'll communicate with the ground station soon. That should be up and running live soon. And I'd like to thank Dr. Kaminsky for her support and Dr. Jernigan for his great mentorship and leading us through this project. And of course my team members, Anna and Alyssa, and then our other collaborators and funding, which is necessary. Thank you. Of them out there. 
And you can check if there's a um, solar flare going on. And solar flares, because normally the sun's pretty quiet and just soft x-rays are coming out of it. But when there's a solar flare, hard x-rays will come out, which is what this detector really picks up. So if you wait until there's a solar flare and then just launch like the next couple minutes later on a uh, high altitude balloon, then you can see those. And you can see if, like, as the detector rotates in its little carrier, you can see the different um, levels of x-rays coming off of the solar flare. That'd be really cool. Yeah. So if it's um, sent into space via balloon launch, how does it get its um, orbital velocity from being launched straight up? For it, What's it to start orbit around Earth? So they're launched as a secondary launch off of other satellites. The satellites, big ones that are built by NASA and stuff, have a lot of dead space in them, just by design. And they made this, I didn't explain CubeSats. So CubeSats are small satellites for space-based missions, like science missions. They're, um, they have a low entry to the market, so they're normally off-the-shelf parts, which makes, t -Logo Cube was, I believe, $500 to build. and. They enable undergrad students to be able to build stuff that goes into space. And a unit of CubeSats is 1U, which is 10 by 10 by 10, and this is a 3U, so that's why it's longer. You just add them together like that. And they're launched off of this standardized launch thing that goes into the satellites, and it pops out. They're just spray them. So then they just pop out. I have a question. Um, so, if a ground station or if an antenna is a ground station and we have antennas in our phone, then is there any way that we could use our cell phones as ground stations? As basically. Like basically. So there's um, there's different because of the frequency and stuff. So um, your phone antennas are designed for different frequencies. Mm -hmm. That's actually I think like three or four in the iPhone currently. So there's your like two GPS ones, mm -hmm. and then you have just different frequencies. So we're currently using the ham. Band, mm -hmm. which is um, amateur radios, so that wouldn't be able to. But if you had an antenna that just connected to your phone and Jerry would let people. Yeah. <laughs> what ideas are on the table for making the helical, the flat helical antenna uh, transparent? Um, I don't know how because I know the helical actually worked pretty well. It was harder to model. It was easier to build, and it's just wires. And if it doesn't quite resonate at the right. Uh, frequency, you just kind of bend them a little. It's like antenna theory is half art, half science. So there's a lot of like working with your hands, and it's actually pretty awesome. So this actually was fine. This can go into implementation pretty well, I'm pretty sure. So that could go. Uh, the patch antenna, I know Dr. Khalil of the engineering department is working on currently with transparent stuff. That's what he does. Other students are getting involved. Uh, yeah, well, this question is not completely related to your capstone project. Well, so in, in just two years or so, you have done so many things. You know, is there something you want to share with you know parents, friends, or other students how you managed to accomplish all this? Um, I think it has to do a lot with club. I remember the first day I went to um, advising with Dr. Steverson, he said to go check out the physics club on campus. And I'm so glad I did because that really like just led to other things and getting even more involved in things. And I don't know if I said no much. I don't think I said no enough. But it's good. It's good. I'm pretty happy where it landed me. So don't say no and get involved. Physics club is awesome. I can't just go. Someone's already not going to it. I think it's over.